Hello everyone and welcome to this fireside chat, Digital Currencies Join the Mainstream. My name is Alice Forward, I am the Wall Street Correspondent at The Economist and I'm joined by Michael Sunnenschein, the Managing Director at Grayscale Investments, the world's largest digital currency asset manager which has more than $9 billion in asset management, sorry, which has more than $9 billion in assets under management. Hello Michael. Hello, thanks for having me. I'm also joined by Michael Morrow, the CEO of Genesis, a digital currency prime brokerage firm, which has enabled institutional investors to trade more than $12 billion worth of cryptocurrency spot volume so far in 2020. Hello, Michael. Hi, Les. God, good to be here. Great. Lucky enough to be joined by two Michaels, so I'll probably call you Michael S and Michael <laughs> M throughout the rest of this, uh, rest of this panel. Uh, just to set the scene, digital currencies have performed well this year, perhaps spurred on by increased economic uncertainty as COVID-19 has upended economies and investment portfolios. Volatility in normal assets has been unusually high, while the traditional relationship between assets, like the correlation between stocks and bonds, has broken down. These dynamics suggest that including new assets might hold more appeal for traditional portfolios. Could one of those assets be digital currencies, and can digital currencies gain widespread institutional appeal? Just to set the scene for this discussion, Bitcoin was founded in 2009 and gained significant worldwide attention in 2017 when it peaked at almost $20,000. Since then, Bitcoin has mostly traded below $10,000 but has gained traction again this year. Uh, Michael S., let's start with you. How has our understanding of cryptocurrency changed since its inception? I think it's apples and oranges. Uh, having been in the space now dating back to the beginning of 2014, the level of conviction, the level of education, um, how much investors are really digging into the space um, has transformed dramatically. I think that there is now such a library of resources available to folks to understand this asset class. And to your point, most investors are starting with Bitcoin. I certainly know at Grayscale, we've tried to do our piece of the educational puzzle um, by providing investors with you know, research tools, portfolio construction reports, um, and then also annually commissioning a annual investor study to understand how these attitudes are changing. And certainly we'd be remiss to not talk about COVID, which our 2020 study actually revealed that over 60% of investors in 2020, their decision to invest in Bitcoin, 60 plus percent of them, that was responsible um, as a result of COVID. Um, and really thinking about portfolio diversification and what should be in their portfolios in the context of a world that's gone increasingly topsy-turvy. Uh, Michael M, same question to you. How has your understanding changed since the inception of cryptocurrencies? So we first um, got involved in trading Bitcoin in early 2013, uh, when the price of Bitcoin was around $100 um, US. And, you know, Michael used uh, the apples and oranges. I'll, I'll use the, the, the night and day. Um, as kind of the analogy of the difference between where we are today as opposed to what we are in 2013. The last seven years has really kind of brought about an evolution uh, of the birth of a brand new asset class. Whereas in our experience in 2013, we, you know, we couldn't even get traditional hedge funds and, and institutional investors to pick up the phone um, to have a conversation around Bitcoin um, to where we are now, um, as well as kind of the the, the involvement of traditional financial institutions, the, the, the CMEs, the Fidelities, um, entering into the space um, and, and, and joined by the crypto native startup firms. I think the products, the services, um, and the level of sophistication, frankly, of both the service providers as well as the investors is a huge difference uh, between where we were back then and where we are here in 2020. So you've both sort of talked about um potential themes that might be getting institutional investors more, more interested. What do you think are the key global themes that are pushing mainstream investors towards cryptocurrencies? Um, let's start with Michael S. Yeah, I think there's no question that thinking about digital currency, particularly in a year like 2020, where, and, and Michael can shed some more light on this from a trading perspective, but if we look back to March, there was a day when Bitcoin dropped over 50% in a single day. It actually um, fell even more precipitously than a lot of other asset classes. But I think this is, for a lot of investors, yet another time when they're seeing the resilience of an asset like Bitcoin, because not only has it 
come back from those March lows earlier this year, but it's gone on to become one of, if not the best performing asset of 2020. And so for a lot of investors, that staying power of the asset class has become really, really important to them. And thinking through the response uh, to COVID, which has been fiscal stimulus and perpetual money printing, a lot of investors are really drilling into the verifiable scarcity of assets like Bitcoin, which have a cap supply. And so when you combine that with the likes of what Michael shared, which is a lot of the incumbent financial services firms getting involved, seeing companies like Square and PayPal and you know a lot of other firms starting to make their first forays into the asset class, you create a whole skew really of, of tailwinds around, around investing in Bitcoin, not to mention that as investors are seeking further diversification, they're looking to new alternatives like Bitcoin and other digital currencies. Michael, and what would you like to add about um, how trading was in Bitcoin this year? Uh, I think the the biggest factor um, as to why the the traditional um, institutional investors are certainly paying more attention um, and and getting involved this year as opposed to years past. I, I think time is such a big element here. Um, when we first got started, you know, um, there was nothing. There was no. Um, you know, futures, there really wasn't a regulated custodian. The on-ramp and off-ramps were really immature and new. And frankly, you know, Bitcoin itself was untested. Um, and you talk about an asset class that has gone through its highs and lows um, over the, the decade plus of its existence, you'd be hard pressed to find something else um, that has withstood <laughs> the level of, um, you know, uh, media attention, scrutiny, the, the good parts, the bad hacks, um, and still, um, in, in, in dead, the, right? how many times have you seen that? Of time, in, in, in certainly in the narrative of, of Bitcoin finally died, you know, that's been told hundreds and hundreds of times. And I think Michael alluded to the resiliency, but the fact when something is called, you know, a, a bubble, if something is called a fraud um, and, and it still years later doesn't go away, I think people start to pay attention to it. And whether or not um, it is an escape from their own fiat currency, um, whether that's in the U.S. or abroad, or if this is the, the inflation hedge in the digital gold narrative, or um, it is still a way to, um, to disintermediate the banks and kind of the legacy financial systems, I think Bitcoin, um, for, for all of its faults, is a different thing to a lot of different people. And in the past, I think that that was considered a bad thing when you couldn't figure out the right narrative. But I do think that over time, the fact that it could be so many different things to so many different people is seen as a positive as to mm -hmm. the, the usability and the functionality of what this new um, technology and this asset class is really bringing to new investors. But I think it's important also to highlight, because this is something that Michael and I deal with all the time, which is that people often think that because they're not using Bitcoin every day to buy a coffee or to, um, you know, in day-to-day -day commerce, that somehow it means that Bitcoin has failed. Um, and, and we take the exact opposite view. To Michael's point, characterizing how much this ecosystem has evolved in the last 10 or 12 years, thinking about, again, custody, trading, post-trade settlement, forensic tools, human capital, actual capital. So much has been flowing into this that you know we'd be the first to say we're maybe at the end of the first inning, maybe starting the second inning um, into where this asset class can ultimately go. And I think that as I think about the life cycle, the different types of investors that are now coming to the table that are either leveraging grayscale investment products to gain exposure to this asset class or who are setting up a trading relationship with Michael's firm and getting directly involved in digital assets. You know, five, six years ago, we were really only dealing with Silicon Valley types, tech entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. folks that were talking about Bitcoin in their cocktail parties. You know, today we're now facing some of the world's largest institutions, some of the most storied investors who have been through all different kinds of market cycles. And to Michael's point, they're all seeing Bitcoin as different things. It's different things to different people. Some see it as a technology play. Some see it as a value transfer mechanism. Some see it as a digital gold. But all 
ultimately every investor who's coming to the table is finding a different reason why they not only a need to pay attention to this asset class but b are figuring out some way that it can be integrated into their portfolio regardless of whether they're a momentum value risk or global macro regardless of what their investment mandate and we find that to be really really encouraging because it really shows us just how far this asset class has come in just a few short years one of the points you both touched upon is this idea that um, traditional institutions, be they central banks, traditional banks or regulators are getting more involved um, in, in this asset class, uh, potentially sort of from an oversight and monitoring perspective. H how does that change the perception of, of Bitcoin, um, you know, when it was sort of in its, in its infancy, maybe at its first innings, as you, as you said, it was sort of more perceived as a decentralized sort of rebuttal to those institutions. Now they're, they're becoming more and more involved. Um, let's go to Michael M first. Um, I think that is a sign of the beginnings of the maturation of, of the asset class. I think a lot of times, I believe Bitcoin in the early days was described as the Wild West. Um, there really wasn't a lot of regulation and kind of law um, involved um, and, and regulated venues were scarce. Um, and as the asset classes continued to grow and we've seen the, the traditional financial, um, you know, the intermediaries and the participants come, become involved, um, we've seen a lot more of regulation and regulatory clarity. Um, and, and for us, who has always operated um, as a regulated entity, uh, Genesis, we have mm -hmm. an SEC Fin registered broker dealer. We have the bit license with the New York State Department of Financial Services and gone about the regulated approach to things. I think the um, the the continuation and, and regulatory uh, bodies getting involved gives investors more confidence that um, areas like market manipulation and fraud are being uh, are being monitored and that there are um, consequences, financial, legal and otherwise, for having for running unregulated venues. Um, and that we've seen, you know, in, in just the re uh, past few months. And so I think that is a positive. Um, and I think more signs of that around the world, not just here in the US, but since Bitcoin is, tra uh, you know, traded around the world, I think the more signs that you see that abroad as well, I think it kind of gives further credibility to the asset class. Yeah, I, there's no question about that. I think if you would rewind the clock, maybe even just 18 or 24 months ago, a lot of investors would have said that they're really excited about digital assets as an investment, but there perhaps wasn't enough regulatory clarity for them to meaningfully allocate to the space. And I know certainly here in the US, we've seen a tremendous amount of engagement from everyone from the SEC to the CFTC to the IRS to FinCEN to the US Treasury. I think outside the US, it's a little bit more of a patchwork and we've seen some regulatory regimes take a much more accommodative versus others taking a more restrictive approach to the asset class. But ultimately, the advent of things like central bank digital currencies, how much this ecosystem is growing, the number of users that are now getting involved in this asset class is, cause, is you know, definitely a propellant for a lot of those conversations to be had sooner than later. And I know certainly from our perspective, I'm happy to share that at Grayscale, you know, in, in Q3 of this year, we brought in over a billion dollars of new investor capital. You know, none of those investors are talking about anything related to regulatory uncertainty. If anything, they feel that the amount of regulatory attention that's been paid has in fact really been a tailwind to this asset class, um, thinking particularly about the fact that we now have the world's first and second um, registered offerings with the SEC. So Grayscale Bitcoin Trust and Grayscale Ethereum Trust are the only SEC reporting digital currency instruments out there. And so this is the kind of validation that um, you know, the industry is, is seeking and that investors need comfort around because ultimately if investors can't get comfortable, um, then we're not going to continue to see brought into access points for them as this asset class evolves. Just, I guess, to, to pick on one example, you know, things like know your client type regulation. I mean, is the answer to that institutions like yourself sitting in between investors and crypto assets or, or how do you get around problems like, like KYC problems? No. So um, we run all of our onboarding through the broker dealer. Um, so mm -hmm. we, uh, we actually onboard them as if they were uh, going to do a transaction facing the broker dealer. Um, even though Bitcoin is not a security, uh, you know, we still treat 
um, the onboarding KYC AML process at the highest level. I think the challenge we have certainly in our asset class is that there's the customer onboarding layer um, and, 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 and document retention and, and client screening, but there's also the know your transaction layer being that all of the transactions on the blockchain are visible on these public blockchain protocols like Bitcoin and making sure um, that there isn't a direct connection right to coins that belong to the Silk Road or any of the dark websites and being able to trace where these coins ultimately came from because certainly mm -hmm. our clients care um, to make sure that the origins of the coins are from clean sources but certainly our regulators care to make sure that we're not helping to, you know, to finance terrorism or to weed out the, the, the to work with the bad guys um, it, that mm -hmm. might be uh, using cryptocurrency for, for, for nefarious reasons. And so that two layer approach um, is certainly very, very helpful. And it's how we certainly get our customers and our regulators comfortable that the, uh, the purposes for why they're buying Bitcoin on places like Genesis are purely for investment purposes uh, and, and not for money laundering or, or anything like that. And, and I think, gosh, you, know, if, if folks, uh, you know, I think if folks were waiting for some new regulatory regime or some new set of regulations to, to come out, um, they might be waiting, you know, potentially a long time. I think that they're certainly here in the U.S. is a very well understood and appreciated, um, you know, notion that digital assets can, in fact, be treated similarly to the way that other investments are. And our regulators are very willing to engage and try and work with them within the existing regulatory frameworks. And certainly, you know, businesses like Grayscale and Genesis are strong evidence of that, of how you serve clients in the absolute right way under the existing, you know, rules and regulations around money service businesses, a KYC, AML, et cetera. And, you know, that's really led to our being able to attract some really amazing investors and be able to, you know, have these businesses flourish. Great. I think we have time for just um, just one more question. So uh, to both of you, I'll go to Michael M first. What does uh, the future hold for the world of crypto, in your opinion? And what advice would you give to any of the audience members who are thinking of dipping their toes in this year? Wow. I wish I had a crystal ball um, to, to, to talk about what's in store for the asset class. But, you know, I certainly am encouraged by what we've seen in 2020. Um, certainly, the, uh, the, the pandemic um, and, and, and the various economies here in the U.S. and abroad have suffered a great deal um, as a result of the uh, economic shutdown, um, as well as uh, the public health crisis. And, and certainly, um, the resiliency, the growth, um, and the level of investment into this asset class in, in the middle of, of one of the world's you know, biggest crises in, in recent memory um, speaks a lot, I think, to the promise of the asset class. And the fact that you know, we're, uh, we're on a panel here at the Greenwich Economic Forum talking about digital currency was certainly unthinkable just a few short time ago. Um, so I think the message certainly to investors, um, I think there's perhaps this idea that they've missed the Bitcoin trade. Um, and I think the message where we're, we're both of us are delivering is that we're still incredibly early. We still don't have a, a Bitcoin ETF. Uh, we still don't have um, a lot of the, the, the traditional investment mechanisms. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think the, the, the possibility and, and the, uh, the return potential in the asset class is certainly there. Um, and that um, it'll just be a, if if LPs are not clamoring for involvement already, um, I think this is certainly an opportunity for 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 investors around the world um, to kind of get involved and have some exposure to, to digital currencies. And um, Michael, last same question to you. I think that we will be the first to say that digital currency as an asset class um, has arrived and that it's here to stay. Um, it is something that needs to be considered by investors of all shapes and sizes, the same they would looking at every other investment opportunity available to them. But we'd also remind people that it is volatile. As Michael said, it's early days. Um, and so it is not something that it should be invested in by everyone. And because it is early days, folks should not be investing into the asset class more than they can afford to lose. And certainly both my team and Michael's team would love to be a resource to folks as they're trying to navigate the space. Mm -hmm.
wonderful. Well, thank you so much both for your time. Um, I found that very enlightening and I hope you, you both found it useful as well.